اوكي بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقه قولي تحيه لك دكتور عبد العظيم ولضيوف الكرام وللجمهور الكريم والمتابعين اونلاين ابو صفحتك في الفيسبوك um, so um, my name is Sam Ahmed I'm one of the clinical fellows of Manchester Royal Infirmary Hospital and today is my first participation in this uh, um, um, a very useful uh, conference and meetings regarding COVID-19 and its implications and complications. So, um, um, I'll be starting with the case presentation of a um, 55 years old man admitted with a one week history of fatigue, and right sided pleuritic chest pain, exertion and dyspnea. Associated with fever, productive cough, and sore throat. So, typical COVID symptoms. And background uh, history of uh, well controlled hypertension and asthma. Can we go next? Next slide. So, um, so this man, this is his uh, regular medications. He's been taking amlodipine um, five milligram for his uh, hypertension and salbutamol and serotonin inhalers for his asthma. So um, when he was presented initially, this is uh, this is his uh, his vitals at his initial presentation. He was febrile, his temperature of thirty eight point one, um, pulse of ninety nine and blood pressure of 410 over 70, and normal respiration, and good oxygen saturation on room air. It's L1 score as two. Next. So um, this is his uh, initial examination findings. He was fully alert and oriented. But he was dehydrated with the dry mucous membranes. Um, chest examination was clear, and cardiovascular was um, no 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 findings in cardiovascular examination. So um, abdomen and CNS cardiovascular no abnormality was detected in examination. Can we go next? Um, so this is his uh, initial bloods. Um, white cell 3.7, mild leukopenia, and the lymphocytes was 1.15, which is normal. Uh, he's got elevated CRB 128, and this is his uh, venous blood gas. Mild alkalosis, and um, lactate was not significantly elevated too. And he's got some elements of abdomyolysis. He's got elevated CK. 879. So um, this is his renal function. So elevated urea and creatinine, um, EGFR 60, and his electrolytes were normal. And he had uh, MSU sample was sent and came back as negative. And also he was swapped at his initial initial presentation at ED. The swab was sent and came back, um, COVID swab, I mean, it was sent and, and came back later as positive. Can we go next? So uh, this is his initial chest X-ray. If you can take a look, there's mild heaviness, bilaterally. So it's uh, indeterminate for COVID. Pneumonia showed mild changes. <clears throat> so um, it was initially treated with IV fluids and IV ketragzone as were well, our hospital protocol. So if um, there's changes on X-ray, we treat as community acquired pneumonia. So um, yeah. So um, surprisingly, three days later, this patient rapidly deteriorated and while scoring four, 
and he was desaturated, and oxygen saturation was 89% uh, on 50 liter oxygen, and developed type 1 respiratory failure. And the CRB has significantly increased to 545, and he has got lymphopenia of lymphocyte side count of 0.5 and it's got elevated LDH, 3,189, and fibrinogen of nine, and mildly elevated ABTT, 38.6. Um, his troponin was negative, and initial ECG shows sinus tachycardia. Next, please. So this is, his chest X-ray when he was deteriorated. If you can see here, there's extensive interstitial uh, changes and shadowing bilaterally, extensive consolidations. Next, please. So, um, transferred to the intensive unit and intubated. And uh, one day later, an intensive unit was st started on a continuous venous hemofiltration. As, as his kidney function got worse. Um, during ICU admission, he was found to have high inflammatory markers and a ferritin level of 22,137. Um, cytokine storm was diagnosed. And patient was started on a recovery trial as per our hospital. And it was started on anakendra, which is interleukin one receptor antagonist. Next, please. This, this is a few days later. Another chest x ray. If you can see, there is an um, endotracheal tube and NG tube. And there's also decline on the left side, left, left next side. So um, then he was extubated following eight days ITU admission, successfully extubated. Next, please. This is another chest X-ray of the same patient. <coughs> so it's improving. Around 10 days later on the ward, the patient has developed new neurological symptoms, including headache and short-term memory loss and lack of concentration. And neurological examination revealed upcoming plantar defects without any obvious neurological deficit. Next, please. So this is his initial CT scan because of the neurological symptoms. If you can see in the, in the right side, the right frontal hemorrhage with surrounding edema, but no, no, no obvious midline shift or, or, or science suggestive in increasing intracranial abrasion. So, um, and then we considered scanning, uh, doing, doing MRI scan to see whether there is there's any infection or ischemic behind this, uh, this bleeding, because sometimes the, the, the basic basology is infection and, and then end with the uh, hemorrhagic transformation. But the MRI scan just confirmed the CT findings and, and ruled out any ischemic stroke or ischemic, ischemic changes. So it's pure hemorrhage. Next, please. This is another view of the same patients, same MRI. If you can see there's, if you can see the bleeding more obvious on the left side, and if you can see there is a hemocytrine ring around the hemorrhage. This is an indication that this is subacute rather than acute 
leading. I mean, it's uh, suggested that around two to three, um, I mean, around two, uh, 10 to 15 days, the, the, the age of, uh, of leading. Next, please. So right frontal lobe and anterior basal ganglia parenchymal hemorrhage on the, CN, on the uh, MRI report. Um, also the patient had MRA, MRA, MRA scan, magnetic resonance angiography. Also was performed and showed no aneurysmal changes or AV malformations. Then we did contact stroke team and rehabilitation. So as we know, if you can go back to the slide. So as we know, COVID patients, uh, uh, there's few cases reported with, uh, of, uh, of uh, COVID patients who developed a neurological complications. And um, stroke, one of the complications of COVID, um, um, both types of strokes, leading and, and, and hemorrhagic and ischemic stroke. So raising the questions is that due to direct invasion of the brain because of the virus, or is that because of uh, overwhelming um, inflammatory response? So, and this is an area of debate. And, um, and also whether is this findings is coincidental because the patient is known to be hypertensive. However, it, it doesn't seem to be like that because he's, he's not, uh, he's, he's a young patient and he's not, long, he's, he's not uh, hypertensive for a long time. He's, he's been hypertensive for like uh, three years, and the, 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 his history suggests is, uh, is not revealing that his, his blood pressure is swinging during this period. So it seems that it was well controlled. So this is raising questions that is these findings is uh, a purely related to COVID, uh, whether due to the virus itself or whether due to the inflammatory response causing the bleeding. Because um, there is um, some series suggesting that the, the, the COVID virus might enter the brain through the through, through the either olfactory nerve or through the receptors. As we know, the the, the coronavirus can use uh, angiotensin converting enzyme two as a receptor, and this type of receptor is expressed in the in the brain in the serial cells. So raising the question is is is, is this is the the, the possible physiology of uh, of uh, complications of uh, of brain complications related, related to COVID, or is it uh, directly uh, is, is that the, the, the is the virus get into the brain through the olfactory nerve? Because there is studies in in mice confirmed that the the virus uh, enters the brain through the olfactory nerve, but it's not that that's not yet confirmed in the, in the humans, and um, in support of this study, um, um, many patients of COVID, they, they developed anosmia. And um, the, the, so, which is sometimes, or, or mostly, it's, it's reversible. And again, raising other questions, whether uh, this anosmia due to effect of the epithelial cells at the back of the nose, uh, that lining the olfactory nerve, or direct invasion of the olfactory nerve. So, um, if although it's, it seems it's not directly related, it's not directly related to the invasion of the olfactory nerve because most of, it, of the patients have got anosmia, they, it, it's, it's, it's reversible. So, so again, um, again, so it's, uh, it's it's mainly supportive. The series are saying it's affected the epithelial cells rather than invasion of the, the olfactory nerve itself. So, um, so this is a case of, uh, so this is another patient who is a 81 years old lady who's been admitted, admitted with COVID and suddenly developed um, symptoms of confusion and headache. 
and cerebellar symptoms in terms of dizziness and um, examination uh, revealed the uh, right side sciatica kinesia and uh, evidence of, of salmoblegia. So this is her MRI, MRI scan. If you can take a look and guess what it show. Can we go to next? So uh, if, if your answer is uh, brain stem encephalitis, you're correct. So there's some changes in the, in the brain stem, in the midbrain and bones. There's some, some type of heaviness suggesting a brain stem encephalitis, which is also one of the reported complications of COVID in the brain. So, and uh, unfortunately, this, this patient uh, was died of this complication. And she had a CSF um, showed um, normal cells, normal glucose, and uh, normal, normal CSF in general, but apart from mild elevated protein. And uh, the uh, CSF also was sent for another virus like Cyber Symbolics, and so it's, it's, uh, it's negative. So CSF was absolutely normal for this, for this lady. And her past medical history is uh, nil apart from COVD. Again, raising other question, whether this direct, direct, directly related to the nerve, to the virus, sorry, or whether it is the other inflammatory response. Next. So, Healthcare providers should be aware that the patient with COVID-19 can present with encephalopathy in the acute setting and during hospitalization. And this is why we, we recommend an MRI scan if, if, if COVID patient develops symptoms of encephalopathy. Next. As I mentioned earlier, a few cases with COVID-19 reported with neurological manifestations and MRI brain should be considered in these patients to look for possibility of brain lesions. And uh, neurologic, neurology manifestations are more common in severe COVID-19 infections compared to non-COVID, the non-severe ones, sorry. Next, please. So, so, um, here the, 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 the list of the complications of, uh, of, um, uh, of coronavirus uh, in the neurology system. So in general, we can divide it into two categories. Number one is parainfectious syndromes and post-infectious syndromes. So um, the parainfectious syndromes, including encephalopathy, so COVID patients, they might, might develop symptoms of encephalopathy, even without encephalitis. And as we know, uh, when, when, when people are sick and, this, and the respiratory system is, uh, is failing, that will have uh, adverse effects on the, on the brain. And because of poor, because of poor oxygenation and, and some metabolic effects of, of the brain, this is, uh, this is another 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 ways of uh, of brain complications and, and patients with severe com uh, respiratory compromise, and uh, also uh, central hyperventilation, one of the complications of COVID, and viral meningitis, so anosmia and agusia, uh, agusia which is loss of loss of taste sensation, which uh, both are reversible, sometimes can be irreversible, but most of the patients, they, 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 they have got a sensation, a taste sensation and, and smell back. Encephalitis, um, few cases reported with encephalitis in China, in Wuhan, and in America as well, and uh, stroke. 
whether it's hemorrhagic or ischemic. And acute necrotizing and hemorrhagic encephalopathy, which is the, I think this is the most dangerous complication and fatal complications of, uh, of, uh, of coronavirus. There's one patient reported with this complication. And also myositis. So uh, the, 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 the virus can affect the peripheral nerves and can affect the muscles and give it rise to um, um, high creatinine kinase. Next, please. So uh, for post-infectious syndromes, this is like acute disseminating encephalomyelitis, brainstem encephalitis, and transverse myelitis, billion barry syndrome, and sensory neuropathy. Um, there is a study, there is an interesting study was well, done in Wuhan, a retrospective study of 214 patients uh, who developed neurological symptoms. And um, they, 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 they divided um, into, they divided the complications into the CNS, CNS manifestations and uh, stroke, including stroke and, and the uh, peripheral, peripheral, uh, peripheral neuropathy. So um, five patients of these 214 patients had had stroke. Um, four of them developed ischemic stroke, and one patient died of uh, of hemorrhagic stroke. Yeah. Next, please. So. Um, so neurological manifestations are more common in, in, in severe infections compared to non-severe infections. And here we can see the risk factors for neurologic complications. And this is included advanced age, cardiac. As we know, the, 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 this virus is known to cause myocarditis. So this is, an, this is another risk factor of stroke. And um, respiratory disorders whether is that um, due to the metabolic effects of, uh, of hypoxia in the brain and uh, hypertension and diabetes. This is the most, uh, most common comorbidities present in patients with more severe manifestations of infection. Next, please. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, can you go back, please? Yeah, and the converting enzyme is the receptor of, of SARS-CoV-2. Um, this is another study. The use of SE inhibitors lead to increased expression of SEA2, making the cells more vulnerable to infection with the virus. Next, please. Yeah, um, the, the clinical studies are underway to test the, this uh, hypothesis. And SCE2 can also be found in the cellular cells, as I mentioned earlier, in the brain, and can be in, in use in neurons. So, raising the possibility that stroke associate, associated with COVID might be directly related to the, to the infection. And I think this is a good area of further studies. Next, please. So, um, risk of COVID-19 for patients with neurologic diseases. So, I mean, what, what's going to happen to the patient who's, who's already known to have a neurological neurology problem and, and develop COVID? So, um, in general, the patients with neurological conditions tend to be uh, older than those without. So the risks associated with COVID-19 are of particular concern for neurologists who care for these patients. And I think we can get more, more information from, from the our neurology consultants attending this meeting. 
So um, next, please. Yeah, this is another dilemma of, uh, I mean, we know that most of neurological conditions are treated with immunosuppressive medications. So I um, mean, so immunosuppressive medication used in the treatment of neurologic, neuro, neurological conditions. For instance, those who, who's been taking steroids. So what's going to happen to these patients? So it's, it's, it's yet unknown how much of an additional risk there is both for infection and for developing a more severe disease cause. Next, please. So, um, autopsy findings have not yet been clearly reported. And I think we need, it's need further studies about the uh, affection of COVID on the brain cells. So coronaviruses, as we know, coronaviruses has been isolated from CSF and brain uh, of patients, for example, with multiple sclerosis. And there's other coronaviruses being isolated, yes, from CSF. But what about uh, COVID-19? So because we, we, don't, we don't normally, uh, not yet we, we, we request uh, COVID-19 CSF. Next, please. Yeah, this is the study was done in Oklahoma in, in America and released like three days ago. Of uh, uh, actually, this is the first uh, autopsy findings uh, released in English literature. So, um, of uh, of a two patients died with COVID, but I don't think this is good examples to. Um, I mean, to, to confirm or to rule out with the direct effect of coronavirus on the brain, because uh, it, it shows uh, normal brain cells and the, 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 the patients who died of, 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 this, uh, of these conditions, uh, as far as I know, none of, none, none of them has developed neurological complications. So but I don't think this is a good example for uh, um, Confirmations of uh, of direct effects of virus to the brain cells. So, um, so in terms of management, so no, uh, there is no proven antiviral therapy for for the human coronaviruses, and the main treatment is supportive, asymptomatic. However, several drugs are being considered for clinical trials and medical treatment of patients. So in, in, a, in our hospital, we, um, we use an camera in cytokine store. And um, what, what we were initially trying hydroxychloroquine, but we no, we no longer use hydroxychloroquine. So um, where do I, there's um, multiple antiviruses being under uh, trial. And we have got immunologists here that can explain more in this area. So, um, yeah, supportive treat treatment in terms of uh, oxygen supply, DVT prophylaxis, and uh, treatment of secondary bacterial infection, and treatment of fever. If you have any questions. Thank you uh, very much, Hussam. This is a very fantastic joke. Uh, now I think Ahmed Adlan, would you like to ask any question or would you like to lead the debate? Okay, um, I think there was just one question from the audience um, regarding the first case, uh, the patient who had a background of hypertension and uh, quite typical presentation for COVID and then developed the cerebral hemorrhage. Was there any uh, ECG abnormalities? Did the patient have an echo? Those are the main questions, really. No, the, the ECG just showed sinus tachycardia and uh, probably due to his uh, uh, fever. Yeah. And did he? Did he? Did the patient have a CT chest? 
you have a CTS, CTS um, on the uh, oh, CT chest, no CT brain. So no, you have no CT chest. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so you can uh, pass it on to the rest of the panel. Doctor uh, uh, Sam, would you like to add any comment on this case? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you very much, uh, Hussam, for presenting, and thank you for the reception, nice reception and uh, invitation. Um, I think it's early days. Uh, it's very early days uh, to conclude about what COVID can do for the central nervous system. Uh, my my colleague Khalid is listening and he can comment after that. Uh, and even uh, as a joke, really, I said to myself working in these busy hospitals, how these people manage to find time to publish these lovely papers, which are coming throughout May, you know, as 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 as, as recent as three days ago, uh, the last two weeks, last four weeks. So just to say, uh, it is still early days in terms of knowing how, uh, how far COVID can affect the central nervous system as well as peripheral. Now, referring to what Hussam has said in terms of the ferris patient, there is a possibility that this is just coincidental in terms of somebody developing frontal uh, hematoma as a hemorrhagic stroke in the context of being having uh, COVID. Now, that is less likely. That's a possible thing, but it's less likely. The most likely scenario is that this patient developed a hemorrhagic stroke because he was in ICU. Now, any one of you who has been uh, had the, uh, the experience of working in, 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 in the setting of ICU or with ill patient will know that people who go to intensive care, critical care, will develop a lot of complications. Uh, one of them, intracerebral uh, involvement. Uh, and one of those can be uh, cerebral hematoma, which could be small. So in this patient, very likely that the bleeding dyscrasias or the degree of rhabdomyolysis he had, evident by CK and the, um, uh, and, and the other hematological disturbances wasn't significant enough to cause uh, failure of the cerebral uh, uh, yeah, blood brain barrier and cause uh, a cerebral hematoma secondary to that. So we still face with the question of this patient is still doesn't have enough vascular risk factors, did not develop uh, pancytopenia enough to bleed in the brain. Uh, uh, and, and so why he had it. So that, that brings a theory which Hussam has illustrated very nicely in terms of link with the angiotensin two uh, receptors affecting the, the autoregulation of the brain. And I just want to add a, a couple of points which uh, Khalid can comment on, which is the, the, the idea behind swinging blood pressure. So if angiotensin is being affected in the brain, you know the blood brain barrier is very robust and is very uh, protective for the brain. However, if, some, if, if something like COVID has messed up the autoregulation, then you could be having blood pressure variable, which is a swinging or labile, and that can rupture the vessels and lead to bleeding. And the role of the patient's age is that you have a pre-existing atherosclerosis and you have uh, myelotendiopathies and all these, which can lead to, the, to those vessels rupturing. That's why maybe younger patients do better when it comes to this. So just to highlight, uh, definitely the COVID can go to the brain directly, can invade the brain, whether through the olfactory cheese, and there are autopsies, they found COVID in the brain. Uh, in terms of isolating it from CSF, not yet. So the summary is uh, COVID can go to the brain, okay. However, the most uh, prominent theory behind the intracranial bleeding possibly related to if, if it is not severe, I'm talking about this patient. If it is not severe, it must be related to the autoregulation. Something to do with failure of the angiotensin co converting, causing uh, autoregulation problem and then rupturing of vessels. Plus or minus edema. And that would present, as Khalid would comment, uh, would present mostly with encephalopathy rather than focal edema. So I think, I think that's what I wanted to say. Definitely, Hussam mentioned about the uh, overwhelming inflammation, especially if the patient is very ill. As this patient now recovered, moved to the ward, is still in hospital, uh, that means the infection wasn't severe, as you could imagine. So the severity of the infection makes a lot of difference uh, here. If it is very severe, causing 
disruption of the hematological factors, pushing a lot of uh, uh, inflammatory mediators to the brain, then that can cause uh, too much damage, which could be global encephalitis or local vasculitic process. Leaving, leaving hemorrhagic strokes aside, uh, COVID has been established as one of, one of the observations we've seen in our unit in Southampton that it causes straightforward ischemic strokes, just like uh, through uh, monoarthritis and, uh, and mono, uh, you know, large vessel or medium uh, sized vessel arthritis, like what we see in TB, tuberculosis, TB meningitis. Okay, so I think that, that, that's what I wanted to say. On the second patient, briefly, uh, I think I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a matter of, of acute uh, process. The only thing is the CSF being normal, uh, Khalid might agree that you make you feel a little bit skeptical about uh, 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 an infection that causes a lot of damage to the brain stem without uh, the CSF being abnormal. So that, that makes me a little bit suspicious that maybe the changes on the brain stem might have been present before that. But, but uh, thank you very much, uh, Fusam. Congratulations. Well done. Good presentation. And, and it's illustrated a, a very good point. And I will just conclude by saying to the panel and to the wider audience, I think COVID is sending a lot of lessons. In terms of neurology, as you know, all neurologists are very slow and take things easy. I think hold your horses and wait. Any virus that affects the human body or affects the brain can cause similar complications. We don't want to rush into causing COVID cause intracranial bleeding or COVID cause becker stuff like encephalopathy or brain encephalopathy. I think any virus is capable of that, uh, as you know. Uh, so maybe some of it because of just an infection, some of it because of it's a virus, some of it because it's a virus went to the brain, and some of it because the patient went to the ICU and he spent time requiring intub intubation ventilation. Uh, if you bring five, six, seven viruses, it will cause the same outcome. So I think this is still early days for this conclusion. But I think this is illustrate very, very well the need to, to, to keep looking. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, Dr. Khaled would you like to add any comment? Um, thanks for much, uh, Dr. Hassan, for this very nice presentation and for the uh, interesting cases. Um, and thanks for um, the highlights from Dr. Assam uh, To be honest with you, actually, uh, we are in the early stages. And uh, what I'm going to say is we have actually more questions than answers. Um, regarding this uh, um, uh, problem, it is, it is a viral infection which can affect both the uh, central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. And uh, more cases actually are, are uh, coming, uh, reported. Uh, this morning we are in a meeting and um, one of my colleagues is a stroke neurologist. He mentioned that more coming, more cases coming regarding micro bleeds in the brain. We don't know exactly the pathology and my message to Dr. Assam, um, the, the definite answer as you know Dr. Assam in neurology, uh, brain neurology problem like this is autopsy, um, come from autopsy and we don't have um, many autopsies uh, uh, from, uh, from uh, uh, these cases. Um, it's quite difficult, so I think we, we better first uh, concentrate on, uh, um, on a few things here in, uh, in his two cases, and, and generally speaking about uh, neurology and the, and the virus itself. Uh, as I said, we, we, we are expecting more cases, uh, 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 neurological cases, which could be very devastating, including William Barry syndrome, to come up in the future. Um, uh, with with uh, with the COVID nineteen cases, um, encephalitis and 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 uh, acute necrotizing encephalopathy. Again, this is very devastating. Adam, which is acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, uh, very devastating cases. We we expect actually in the future to see uh, uh, many cases reported in the literature uh, about these things. Regarding the pathologies, um, is it's, it's too early at the moment, uh, especially about the bleeding. Uh, but we we can have uh, we can have good explanation for the uh, for the um, ischemic stro uh, stroke here in these cases. Uh, don't forget it is a virus like other viruses which can cause vasculitis. Uh, it it is known to cause myocarditis. This is another uh, uh, potential site for thrombus coming. All right. Um, this can explain the, the ischemic uh, ischemic uh, uh, stroke. 
but as you said regarding the, the hemorrhagic stroke or uh, uh, brain bleeding, we still don't have a definitive answer uh, to this, why it's happening, whether, uh, as you said, uh, uh, given that the patients are elderly patients, they have hypertension, they might have a myeloid angiopathy, and this needs um, uh, um, to, to be explored in the future, all right? Um, the patient has hypertension, this patient for three years. We know hypertension could be maybe even longer than this before starting the treatment. Um, my gut feeling um, uh, with this MRI, uh, that this, uh, this uh, uh, right frontal lobe hemorrhage, as Dr. Isam Ezzedin said, might be uh, coincidental. Uh, but going back to the other case, uh, which is clinically is definitely encephalopathy. We do have, we are seeing uh, um, some changes actually in the brain stem um, and, and, and putting things together. Um, I'm not sure at which stage the CSF was done, uh, but if uh, you know, Dr. Esam, that even in um, uh, HSV encephalitis, uh, if you do the CSF early, the CSF will come back normal, even including the uh, viral BCR. And the recommendation from the Liverpool ID um, uh, guys is to repeat the CSF again, maybe in 48 to 72 hours. We do have a lot of experience with this in Nottingham, um, where I myself, I did repeat the CSF after 48, 72 hours. And the CSF was significant, even the viral BCR come back positive. So why not uh, the same case in, in uh, COVID-19, given this is a virus, viral infection? Um, the other thing is um, this patient actually, he. Uh, we couldn't find anything else to explain his encephalopathy, which is evident clinically. And even the presentation is of uh, brainstem. So um, we can say that this could be, uh, could be a case here from the uh, COVID-19. And the most important point here is um, uh, if this is a case and we're uh, going to get um, another cases of brainstem encephalitis, uh, then we have another problem here because the patient presenting initially with respiratory symptoms, intubated, successfully extubated, and then go back to have a, a, a brain stem involvement, which we know is going to cause hypoventilation again. And there is a, the, there is a paper I saw it this morning is uh, actually wondering whether some of the patients, even who were uh, intubated early on, whether the hypoventilation is respiratory or it is related to the brain stem. Uh, the, the difficulty here, especially here in, in UK and other parts of the world, is uh, now the MRI is not going to happen immediately with these patients who are COVID positive. Uh, a lot of precautions going on here. We, we, we experience this now every day in our wards, uh, saying that um, the patient is highly risk, infectiously highly risk. We are not going to do an MRI. CT is very quick, five minutes can be done easily. CT is just rubbish in brainstem, and you can, uh, you can get just a normal CT or a remarkable CT um, uh, in a patient with uh, brainstem encephalitis. So this is uh, another difficulty here. Um, Hussam is lucky actually to get uh, MRI on uh, uh, these two cases. Um, so this can, um, can be another, uh, another problem in the future. Um, and then as I said, um, we are still uh, early um, in the urology cases um, report of COVID-19 positive uh, uh, patients, but I do expect to see patients with Guillain-Barre syndrome. So uh, it will be another uh, catastrophe that the patient survive um, uh, respiratory failure, uh, go back home two, three weeks later, started to have ascending neuropathy and then back again, uh, uh, Guillain-Barre, which is going to affect his respiratory muscles uh, and get back to the ITU again with um, uh, uh, with respiratory failure and intubation. So it will be uh, a big problem. Um, and then back to the, to the immunosuppressants and the disease-modifying therapies. Um, uh, it is a big question uh, about those who are um, on immunosuppressive uh, therapy. Um, the only thing coming through in the literature now and uh, NICE and, and the NHS uh, published recently is regarding the MS patients. And quite interestingly, actually, most of the medicines we are using for the MS, including interferons, um, uh, the recommendation is to carry on, continue. Uh, and there is no evidence uh, that they're, uh, they're um, uh, going to affect the COVID-19 patients. 
Uh, in fact, even uh, some of these um, uh, medicines, which uh, cause lymphocyte to be in there, like fingolomoid, which is gilinia, or uh, dimethyl fumarate, they didn't find uh, significant worsening uh, of uh, COVID respiratory symptoms. And the recommendation is to continue giving these um, uh, medications. Other things in, in uh, immunosuppressants will be the mycenia patients uh, taking microphenolate or azathioprine. Uh, um, or taking uh, brednisolone uh, steroids, um, we still we don't have uh, the data, um, and and still the recommendation is the, the, the consultant physician looking after the patient should um, uh, treat individually. Uh, so a lot of questions, uh, few answers. Um, Doctor Esam he 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 gave very good point about the pathology in the brain about what's what's happening. Um, uh, regarding the blood-brain barrier, uh, regarding because the patients are, uh, are, um, are um, uh, old patients, whether this is because of fragility of, or uh, atherosclerosis mm -hmm. of, uh, of the vessels. Uh, I think these all are reasonable justification from Dr. Hassan, but the problem, as I said, is uh, it is too early um, and it's quite difficult to answer all these questions at the moment. But um, I do expect um, uh, a lot of um, uh, neurology uh, problems related to COVID to come through in, in the near future. Thank you. Another question, can I ask? Uh, thank you very can much. You... Yes, Hind, you can ask, but uh, yeah. I think we're a little bit running behind the time. Yeah. We can just make it in one minute before <laughs> yeah. we pass it to the immunology okay. and hematology yeah. team to start the second session. Yeah, go ahead, Tim. My question, my question about the lumbar puncture procedure, procedure in, on, the, on those patients, do you deal with them like the normal, um, you know, patient without COVID, uh, particularly if they're confirmed or even if they have clinical suspicion without like a confirmed uh, test? So the procedure, what is the threshold for doing the lumbar puncture and uh, what precautions do you do it with a, just a surgical mask? Uh, what exactly the? Well, well if, if the patient is COVID positive, um, uh, we we take the full precautions. We do have I, I do have one patient uh, the week before last week was COVID positive. He went to ITU. He had the lumbar puncture, but was with uh, full precautions. But if the patient is um, like having just fever symptoms and, 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 and he's COVID negative or uh, still you don't have the result, you can just have the surgical mask and um, have the, the, the routine one, which you, you do as, as usual. Okay. 